Good morning. It's good to see everyone today and appreciate your interest in spiritual things. Many things you could be doing today. The most important thing to do today is to serve the Lord your God. And that's true of every day of your existence. And we are blessed to come together today to have communion with our God, communion with our Jesus Christ. I don't mean the taking of the Lord's Supper, though that's important, but we always want to remember we share right now in participation with our God who is in this worship with us. He is receiving the worship. It is a fellowship thing. Our God is here with us. And this is a tremendous, tremendously beautiful and awesome thing that we are enabled to do by the Lord our God. And of course, someday we hope to be in his presence, where we can tell him what we think about him, and we can watch him in his glorious work. That's going to be quite an experience. And we have been taken by a lot of mass shootings. Um, It seems like recently, it seems like it's more than ever. I was kind of surprised in looking up mass shootings and the ratios and the the statistics that we see throughout the world, I was really kind of surprised to find out that the United States is not the leader of mass shootings. And to date, the United States has had about 165 mass shootings, which is basically detailed as four or more people shot. 165 from the beginning of the year until now. But actually, we're way down like number 11 as far as, as the world is concerned, mass shootings that, that take place. Uh, as far as our number is concerned, Norway is really, really up there. Of course, we don't have a lot of the communist com- countries weighing in on this. We don't know exactly what goes on. But so this kind of tells us that the world's a crazy place because it sure seems like we're hearing about mass shootings all the time, right? Some days have four or five mass shootings in them. And I don't know if there are more than there used to be. I, I looked out, I looked up the last 30 years or so, and you'd be surprised how many there were in the 90s. I remember as a kid, it seemed like we did not have what we have now. And back then, the news talked about everything like that. And I remember the University of Texas Tower killing, some of you might. We lived near Colleen, Texas, and On October 16th, 1991, I remember that date because not far from us was the the killing of the Luby's killing. And then there was a Fort Worth Baptist church, a Baptist church in in Fort Worth that that had shootings when we were living in Temple, Texas. And we we saw things back then, but it, it seemed like things have really, really spiraled. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure. I can't find data between the 20s uh, or 40s in 1980, and then compared that to 1980 until today. But one thing is for sure, we really do live in a, in a bad place. Just think, <clears throat> the truth of the matter is that the United States is actually number 66 on the list of countries in terms of mass shooting rates per capita. Per capita. That really says that there's a lot of bad stuff going on everywhere in the world. And that's mass shootings let alone mass stabbings, you know, let alone mass bombings and and things like that. But I think what this says is we live in a pretty bad world. Of course, you knew that before 1980. What was World War II anyway? But one of the greatest mass genocides and mass shootings, World War I, what was that? The, The Great War to end all wars. Well, it didn't really do that, but it did show just what's going on in our world and the satanic nature, how many people are really sucked up into the dark side of Satan and will follow out the world of Satan. Well, here's some dark statistics maybe. You know, maybe that's the real dark side we're talking about, but it's kind of a segue into where we're going today. We began here recently to talk about Seeking God 101. The truth is our whole world needs to seek God. And having God is the answer. When you don't have God, you're going to spiral out of control. Who knows where a culture is going to go? Who knows uh, where a family might go, an individual might go? 
When you don't have God, there are a lot of things that can happen, and who knows what the potentiality of that is. When a person totally lets go of their conscience, well, we lived in Denver when a guy shot 70 people. And these things can happen. But there's something beautiful about seeking God. It's a different life. And we're thinking about the idea of just opening ourselves up to, to know who God is and, and to see the big picture of who God is because that's something that it does something to you. When you seek God, it does something to you in a very, very big way. And today I like to think about the idea of God is much more than we can really possibly know. God is more than we can possibly know. You might have all kinds of ideas about what God is and try to expand that all the time, but no matter what you think God is, God is incredibly more than whatever you can think that, that He is. And out of this comes then a human being consumed by the idea of the ultimate reality we talked about before. God is even more than I can imagine and that has a relevance to me in my life. We'll come back to that. You know, we cannot know the totality of God. We know that Jesus, Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17, created the world. For by him all things were created in the heavens and on the earth. Things visible and things invisible. And there we got the idea that everything exists. Heavens, earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things have been created through him and for him. And this, this puts Jesus in a very big spot, doesn't it? He is before all things, and in him, in him all things are held together. This sees Jesus as the creator of all the dimension, the things of the heavens, the things of the earth. Every power that is, is something that owes itself to Jesus Christ and his power. That puts him in a very, very high place. He's before all things. In him, all things are held together. And we get the idea that this, this system is not a closed system that somehow could just go on for who knows how long, all by itself. But it's rather the idea that all things are held together by Jesus Christ, by the power of God. That if you took God out of this picture, this thing like a big spring would just, just go unjubble that it wouldn't be here anymore. <clears throat> and we come to the idea, of course, that God is then this ultimately great, immense, huge being. And I'm not really talking about size of being today, although that kind of comes into it. We kind of sometimes want to say, how big is God? Well, he must be more than 300 feet tall. And he must be, you know, 55 miles tall, you know. How, how big is God? Really, that is, doesn't enter into the question. We can't really talk about the a spatial aspect of God or geom, geom, geometrical uh, aspect of God or a volume of God or anything like that. We're really left in an undefined status in a lot of ways when we come to trying to figure out the immensity of God, how big is God, and the totality of God. In Colossians 1, 16 and 17, if we had nothing else, we'd kind of put us there. But in Jeremiah 23, 24, can anyone hide himself, God says, in secret places so that I shall not see him? Do I not fill heaven and earth? We get the idea of uh, God, an, an immense God. And he's more than, of course, he's not a, a corporal body. He's not a physical body as we think. God is not body. He is spirit. And thus we go into a dimension that we can't really even fathom because we can't fathom anything we cannot see here, which is just all kind of imagination. How big is this great spirit being? How immense is the great spirit being? We, we cannot have any kind of way to define that. There's nothing from one standpoint that even we as little tiny brains could comprehend the totality of God even more than we can, any more than we can hold the ocean in a teacup. It's just not, not possible. But God says, do I not fill heaven and earth? Psalm 39, you probably know this well. Oh, Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. He makes this statement. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. <clears throat> 
not wonderful like. That's a really good thing. Usually when the Bible uses the term wonderful or is translated, it's the idea of full of wonder. It's an inconceivable, incomprehensible sort of thing. Such knowledge is full of wonder for me. I cannot attain it. It is high and I cannot attain it. And the psalmist is saying, I can't grasp God what you're doing. Which brings us to the idea that we want to grasp God, don't we? We really want to grasp everything that God is. We want to grasp Him in His totality. And the psalmist says, when I think of these things, I, I realize it's too high and I, I can't attain it. It's, it's too wonderful for me. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I go from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Hell not being here judgment, but the idea of death. Most translations would, would use the term death here. In other words, God, where do you escape from God? You're not going to escape from God because His, his presence is, is everywhere. This is the immensity of God. There is no place that you can go and God is not there. You can't travel to the outer regions of the universe and find some special cubbyhole and hide in it and God can't see you. Here's the immensity of God, that God is everywhere. God knows all things. What an impressive God that, that we have, that we have. And we realize that God does not even try to give us a complete definition of His immensity. He's going to give us some glimpses here as we're going to, to see here a little bit, but God doesn't try to create the container of Himself as if it could be done and then describe that in a narrative or some sort of training manual for, for us to get the whole picture of God. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, nor are your ways my ways. That, that says a lot right there. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And we somehow get the idea that God is beyond anything that we can call a norm. God is beyond that which is in commonality with us, so far beyond us that, again, how do, how do we get this? It is too high for me. Such knowledge is too wonderful, too full of wonder for me. We can't, we're not going to get the, the picture of God. We can't even get the full picture of the universe. We can't even comprehend the universe in its totality, let alone to try to, to have a full picture of what God is. I think it's interesting in Judges 13, 17, and 18 that Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? That, that when your words come to pass regarding the, the birth of Samson, that we may know you. The angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name since it's too full of wonder? Some of you have a version that says incomprehensible. That, that's the idea. Why do you want to know my name? You can't understand it. <laughs> but here's the angel. I'm not going to tell you my name. You can't understand my name. You're, you're not going to get it. In other words, these are things that are so far above us and so beyond us. We, we can't begin to picture these things. Now, the truth is that we like to put God in our own little box. This is a very human thing. And we think of Daniel 3 and verse 15 when Nebuchadnezzar was upset with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now these, you've been elevated to politicians and you're not falling down and worship my God. Well, you're going to fall down and worship him now. And when you hear the horn, the flute, harp, lyre, psaltery, symphony with all kinds of music, it's great glory as you can imagine that. The, the glory that was going on with this. When you hear all this, you will fall down and worship the image which I have made. Good if you do that. If you do not, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And here's his little box. And who is the God that will deliver you from my hands? <laughs> what a little box of God that Nebuchadnezzar had. Gods are not even powerful enough to deliver someone from his hands. Now, that said a lot about what he thought about himself, but it also shows a little limited box that he had regarding deity. And the truth is, we all have this little box, don't we? This is what humans do. 
it is classic mythology. Mythology is building a box about what God is and putting in it whatever I want to want to put in it. But we as Christians can do the same thing. We can have a box and we expand our knowledge. We put a little bit more about God in that box and we learn some more and, and we've, our box is getting bigger. But no matter what, it's still a little human box contained in the human mind. And we've already said we're not going to conceive the, the full nature of God. No matter what your box is, you're not going to, to have that represent the totality of who God is. And so we all come to this, really. When we think about God, we're not going to get Him in His totality. We can kind of only grab the small glimpses that are given to us about His greatness. But this is enough. It's enough to bring us to the Lord. Small glimpses of His greatness truly are things that have to do with true greatness, enough for human, humans to stop and to pay attention to the Lord God. You're familiar with the Hubble spacecraft and the pictures that it's been taking now for, for almost 30 years, or about 30 years. Uh, back in the 90s, it was decided to focus the Hubble on a dark, dark place in space and let it photograph that for, for 10 days. Now, this was an incredibly expensive thing to do. We have no idea how much it costs to operate uh, the Hubble. Then later on, in about 2009 or so, they did it again, and it's called the Ultra Deep Field, the Deep Field and the Ultra Deep Field. And what the Hubble did, which it has like 13 cameras on it uh, that photographs in different ways, receives information in different ways, ultraviolet rays, et cetera. <clears throat> but it, it photographed at a trajectory that was a very small trajectory. If you took a tennis ball and you put it a 100 meters away, 100 yards away, the trajectory here of the line from your eye to that tennis ball, it wouldn't be very big by, by the time it got there. But that's the trajectory, that's the cone that we're looking at that is going to go out into space and going to then receive the data that is, that is out there. This cone or this trajectory of what was being photographed, even going through the Wilkie, Milky Way, would only be like two to three stars wide. That's, that's how thin that this cone really is. So we're told that it was able to see like 10 to 15 billion light years away, which I think is interesting. We'll come back to that here in just a minute. But in other words, in other words it was able to receive a whole lot of data peering into the, the dark aspect of, of the universe. And so after, you know, both of these took a matter of, of years to, to really receive the data, a year or two to think about the data and to interpret the data, but the deep field of the 90s was able to see in that picture 3,000 galaxies in that little, little tiny dark speck, which it's represented by holding a grain of sand at the end of your, your arm at arm's length. That's how, how big the hole is, looking into the future and looking into the, the, the universe and, and photographing it. The ultra deep. Uh, process a little later, came up with 10,000 galaxies in that little, little tiny speck. Now, a galaxy can be something that only has 100 million stars in it, a few hundred million stars. Or it might be something that has 100 trillion, these are, this is from NASA, 100 trillion stars in it. I think this is an amazing, amazing thing. One little spot in the universe. And here it is seeing all that. Now, 10 to 15 billion light years and photographing, that's, that's an amazing thing to see or to say. Um, some theorize that the universe is 29 billion light years, you know, across, which this would be in the, it's seeing halfway through the existence of the universe. Uh, I kind of doubt that personally. Um, I know there's all kinds of theories to put together here that are far beyond me. Um, even to think about the universe as having an edge, we've talked before, just trying to show 
the greatness of what God has done, but the universe, even if it was 20, you know, 29 billion light years across, that's, that's, that's a pretty amazing day. But what, what do we do if we get to the edge of that? Does that mean, you know, that all of a sudden we, we get to the edge and we knock on something and say, what, what's on the other side of that? Of course, this is supposed to be an expanding universe. But are we really going to get to the edge of the universe? In other words, is, is this not an, a, a universe that is infinity? Is there an edge to this universe? Do we get to the edge and then we stop? Where did God create an infinite universe? And I would tend to think that God, in showing who he is, created something of an infinite, infinite universe for us to dwell in. But we don't know the answers to all those things. But what we do know is that in what man observes, we see something that's extremely powerful, extremely mighty, something that is extremely large. It's huge. It's magnificent. What an amazing thing to talk about 10,000 galaxies just in that speck, just in that ray that's going out. Now, what's amazing about all this in Isaiah 40, verse 12, it says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Measured heaven with a span, the span having to do with fingers. Calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. Weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Now, a lot of Isaiah has a lot of poetry built into it. And here, here are different words that are, they're all different. There's seven or eight words here that all have to do with weighing and, and a scale and marking something out. But the idea is, here is God that did this. And we have this, this idea of God just sitting there. You know, here's the span. He measured it with a span. It's like he's working with his hands, making some little project. Like, kind of like you're working with a Rubik's Cube or something. And here is God working with his universe. And, and God says, who's, who's measured the waters? Who, who's measured the heaven with a sand? Who knows all that? God knows exactly the volume, every, everything that is. The idea being of, of how huge God is, because God brought all of this to be. And everything that the universe is, in all of its totality, is something that God can measure within his own hand. In other words, this immense, more than we can imagine being, who has this tremendous understanding and knowledge, design capabilities and executing capabilities, the ability to put all things together. And if he wants to make it in six days, he could do that. He could do it in three seconds if he wanted to do it. It wouldn't matter. But this is who God is. Now, Isaiah 40, verses 27, 28 says something else. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my just claim is passed over by, by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. And we talked about this before, but Isaiah 40, it's, it's so power, powerful. The, the idea that God does not faint nor get weary. You know, if I had just created all of the universe, I would be tired, wouldn't you? That'd be pretty taxing, wouldn't it? No, I, I, get, I get tired if I mow the yard. I mean, we can, we can get tired of these little, little tiny human projects. Consider the idea of, of the immensity of God. God never got to, all. Just imagine all of the designs of God to the, to the smallest, from the smallest cellular complexities all the way up to the working of all the principles that, that make planets revolve and gravity and solar systems and, and galaxies and, and the, the spatial necessities for all of that to be. And it says that God does not get tired or weary. Just imagine God created all these things and God's not tired. It hasn't been a hard day. It didn't take a lot of intensity from God. The idea is very clear that no matter how we might want to project God. He's a lot bigger than what we think he is. He's a lot more immense. He's of a much more greater magnitude than we can possibly imagine. 
that he could create everything that, that he is. And, and we're still trying to discover that it will be as long as we're on earth, trying to, to figure all this out, the universe. And all of that is just, you know, put a couple things together here, make it happen. God is an amazing God of great power, of great gravity, of great magnitude. And what he presents to us is something that really says, I'm more than you can possibly imagine. And once we begin to look at our box and what we put in the box, we think, now I think I know God. I've got God. No, just erase all that. Just, just say, I don't get the totality of God. All I've got in my box are some things I know about God, but that's all. God is much more than we can possibly comprehend. It is too wonderful for us. It is too high for us, as the psalmist said, for us to understand these things. Of course, God was trying to get the idea over to Job that he is God. Job had a little bit of a problem with what God was doing in his own life. And he was actually judging God in the process of his own suffering. God comes back and says, Job, maybe you better pay attention to the fact that I am God. And he makes a lot of, of, of uh, points to Job, like, where were you when, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Who determined its measurements? God did that. To what were its foundations fastened? What was the cornerstone of the universe? Where does it sit? What influences the outside of the universe for the universe to be what it is? Uh, God knows that. Who shut the sea within doors? Have you commanded the morning since your days began? And again, the idea of Jesus and his power over all things that continue, continue on a day-to-day -day basis, enabling the operation of this world. Have you entered the springs of the sea? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Can you even see into death? Can you know what's down there in death? You just see the, the magnificent nature of what God is. Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth, Job? Now, you want to explain me, Job. See, that's Job had his box, just like we do. And God was acting outside the box that Job had for him, and so he was complaining about it. And basically, God says, Job, I'm so much more than you comprehend. Maybe you better trust, trust who God is and let him be God. He continues, where is the way to the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place? Light and darkness. Have you entered the treasury of the snow? Have you seen the treasury of hail? Have you thought about the, the, what way is light diffused? Where did all these things come from? How, what was, who was the designer? Who was the executioner of all of these things? Who created precipitation? You know, what are the you know, simple scientific principles, right? But yet, how did all of this come to be? God is saying, God is the answer to all these things. Who has divided a channel for the overflowing water or the thunderbolt, path for the thunderbolt? God has designed these things in, in great power um, so that they are powerful things in themselves and they have effects on the face of this earth. Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades or loose the belt of Orion? Pleiades is interesting. <clears throat> uh, well known, a cluster of stars, its own mythology. Uh, in fact, if you've ever seen a Subaru, the Subaru has the Pleiades on it. And in fact, Subaru, the, word, the term Subaru has to do with the Japanese term for the, the Pleiades, and they adopted that name as the name of their company. I always thought it was some guy's name, you know, or something like that. Here's the, here's the Pleiades. Have you bound the cluster of the Pleiades? Have you loosened the belt of Orion? I've mentioned before, that's my favorite. You know, you look up the sky and there's Orion. There's someone looking down at you and you can see his belt and, and uh, how awesome Orion is. And, you know, these constellations have been very impressive to humans, humans throughout humanity. And some of them have attributed divine things to these, uh, to these constellations and tied them to their gods. But who's in control of all these things? Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades or loosen the belt of Orion? 
The answer is here for Job, God is the one that's God. Who's put wisdom in the mind? Job, who built, them, who built the mind to consider things, to think about things? Who built it to consider abstract ideas? Who built it to even consider the divine? Who's given understanding to the heart? God created a human being with tremendous capability. We'll come back to it in just a moment. But how amazing it is that God, in a very small way, by comparison of who He is, only by his little dabbling with the human, you know, with, uh, with the universe, the physical universe, God in his very small ways has given us a glimpse into a being that is, is so great, of such great magnitude, and is much more than we can possibly in our little tiny brains come to fully comprehend. Now, what's amazing in all of this is that we can know what God wants us to know about Him. And that's what's good for the human. We don't have to know the totality of, of what God is. All we have to know is what God wants us to know about Him, and that's efficient in the working of God's plan. Now, God made us in His image, Genesis 1 and verse 27. So God created man in His image, and He's given something special to us. And this, is, this has been thought of, you know, for, for a long, for hundreds of years, hundreds of years ago, uh, uh, the, the concept was brought up that somehow something's special about man, and there must be something He shares with God that animals cannot do, animals don't have it. And I think this is exactly true horses don't sit there and think about their existence, I don't think. You know, fleas, I don't think, sit there and think, contemplate the moon and what all that means and the, the movement of the stars, but, but we do. Humans are the ones that sit here and contemplate, you know, what does all this mean? Uh, where is all this going? Uh, how does all this affect me? Where am I in all of this? God made us in His image, and we are the ones that do contemplate these divine things and the implication of these divine things in our own lives. And this is really, really huge. But of course, in sharing these things with us, not that we would know the totality of God, we can know what He wants us to know. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law, Psalm 119. The idea is just help me to see what you've said, Father. We, we learn a lot about God. We've seen some things about His power. We learn about His righteousness. We learn about His love, His holiness. We see Him demonstrate Himself in a lot of different ways in all of these things. We have an amazing God, and, and these things are, are given to us. We can learn about God in His Word, and that's, that's the idea of, of seeking God. The Word of God and God go hand in hand. It's in His Word that we began to become consumed by who God is, consumed by His being greater than I can possibly comprehend. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. And Paul says these things are saying things that God gave to us. By revelation, He, Jesus, made known to me the mystery so that you could read these things and you could understand my knowledge in Christ. In other words, God gave us His Bible to understand the things that He said were necessary for us to know, to understand and know, so that we could obey Him. And He's given us quite a lot. He's given us plenty as human beings, plenty to grow in, so that it's a lifetime, right, to grow in all these things. All of these things in His Word are efficient to walking with God, knowing what we need to know about God, and coming to the point of trust in our God so that we'd be willing to sacrifice our lives and to follow this all-consuming God. And so the Word of God has been given to us to know these things. And it's truly an amazing thing that, you know, in all that God is, and the giving of His Word, why is it that He even has paid attention to me? God has now tried to teach me about Himself and also teach me that He's someone that I can't fully understand. 
And then we get back to, then why are you, God, even fooling with me? Don't you have more important things to do? Doesn't God have God stuff to do beyond us? No, we are part of the God stuff that he has to do. We are part of his plan. We are part of what he wanted to accomplish in this existence. Psalm 8, verse 3 to 9. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We get that. How is it that God could pay such attention to me? Because we have this great immense God that also is a personal God who loves us. Psalm 65, 4, here's, we'll bring this up as a memory verse. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you. See, if we're receiving all of this immensity and who God is and all of his magnitude, if we're consumed by, by the overriding presence of God, then all of this begins to, to impact us in a huge way. Blessed is the man you choose. Amen. And cause to approach you. Amen. God made it possible for me to approach the God that I cannot even fully define? Blessed is the man you choose. This choosing, by the way, is, is operational with our coming to God. He chooses those that will walk with him. But it is this one that established the mountains of his strength, and you visit the earth and water it, and you greatly enrich it. Blessed is the man you choose. Now, where does all this take us in our existence? You see, if this is the great I am, if this is, as we talked about a few weeks ago, the great reality, then don't we have to be consumed by who he is? We're not talking about brilliant men. We're not talking about the, pin the pinnacle of humanity. We're talking about God that is so far beyond us that the most brilliant cannot in totality define him. Where does all this take our existence? Well, it takes us to this point that I live under this almighty God. I live under him. That must have some kind of significance. There must be something that I'm supposed to do. Why am I here? What is my purpose? See, it's all seeking God, isn't it? The presence of the great I am is not a static statement, as we've talked about before. It doesn't sit there with, with no significance. God is the great I am. He's the great totally in totality, the un, undefined existence, the divine one. That comes down to truly touch my existence. At a very personal level, what, what should my today even be looking like? What should my mind be doing? What should be impacting me if there is an all-consuming God that is running the universe and holds all this within his hand? And what we learn as we seek God, I, don't, I think some disciples don't get here and some do. But when you learn about the all-consuming God that is more than you can possibly imagine, you begin to yearn for this God. You yearn for Him. You put out your arms to know Him. You want to know more of Him. You, you yearn to be in relationship with Him. Especially when you learn that the all-consuming God loved me so much He gave me His Son on the cross. Why would He do that? Everything that we learn about the great I Am is something that cooperates with a God-created heart to yearn for the divine, to yearn for God and to find God. And thus we have Acts 17, verses 28 through 31. That the bounds that God has created for humans is for us to seek after him, to grope. Remember that idea of grope? As you try to find something in a dark place, seek after him. And it says that he's not very far from you. If you reach out after him, you're going to find him. But here's the yearning of the soul, our awesome God that can turn us in this direction. And with that, of course, if we're, if we're sitting under the all-consuming God, 
when we sit under greatness, it seems it tends to do something to us. Even if you sit under great humans, brilliant humans, that you know, this man is my mentor. Uh, I, I better seat myself under him and try to learn from him rather than to try to get over him and tell him something. I recognize his greatness and brilliance. I want to learn something from him. We all have people like that, probably. But here is God. See, when we, we know his immensity and his magnitude, his power and his almightiness, then there is the need under the all-consuming God to assume our role as created beings and to bow our hearts and to bow our minds to God. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. When we have a psalmist. He got it, didn't he? I'm going to sing to the rock of salvation. Why? because this Lord is the great God. Well, tell me more about this great God. I want to know everything. I can't tell you everything there is about this great God, but we know enough to know what a great, great God He truly is. Psalm 146 and verse 8 says it well. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. And then we begin to understand that this great, awesome God loves a people that recognize their role before Him, and they bow themselves down before Him, not because God's the egomaniac. We've talked about before that before. It has nothing to do with that. It's assuming the correct roles. What else would there be with an all-consuming God but the created beings that understand their role to be subservient? and to fulfill the plans of the Almighty One. That's our role. If you want to seek God, in one way you can call this the end of your journey, but it's the beginning of your journey. You bow yourself down before your Lord. You follow your Lord. And you know that someday you're going to stand before the God you cannot even fully define, but someday you're going to stand before Him. If you're right with Him, He's going to bring you into His eternal love. This is a God I want to bow before. This is a God I want. I want to be consumed by the idea of an all-consuming God. That's who we are as humans. We're just little things that have been exalted by the great God to be loved by Him so much that He would want to bring us to Himself. Again, seeking God 101, simple things. <clears throat> that, of course, goes into areas of great complexity. <clears throat> but simple ideas of something, someone much greater than ourselves and this being the great reality, how important it is that we not live a concentric life, not be looking in the mirror all the time. My life's about me. My life is about physical things. My life is just about the sensual here on the face of the earth. Wow. There's so much for us to be aware of and to live under. And his name is God. How beautiful and how awesome. So encouragement to seek your God. And this is true if you don't know God, but it's also what we continue to do as seekers of God, right? You never stop doing this. You seek Him. You might be 65 someday or 75, but the day is not going to stop if you're seeking God that you're going to be in awe of who He is and what you don't know about Him, but you're going to be in awe of what you do know and in awe that He would want to bring you to Himself and give you eternal life. Maybe you want this eternal life. All things are ready. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you can use that belief and faith to drive yourself forward to obedience to Him. I hope that you'll think about what the Lord wants you to do. You can come today changing your life, repenting 
of your sin, confessing Jesus Christ and being baptized into the body of Jesus Christ, wherein you can be raised to walk in a newness of life, never to die spiritually again. If you're ready to obey the Lord, the water's right here. Why not obey him right now? Together we stand as we sing.